Okay, everybody, we're back to Planet Comic Book Radio, and uh, our guest today is Richard Dominguez, uh, creator of El Gato Negro. And Richard is joining us this this Super Tuesday, ironically enough, uh, from his uh, home studio there in uh, Dallas. Uh, Richard, hi, welcome to the show. Hola, Javier, how's it going? Oh, very good, sir, very good. Uh, if I sound a little stuffy or stuffed up to you or the audience, uh, I was I had a really bad head cold this morning, and so I tried to take as much uh, home remedies as I could. So hopefully uh, I won't sound too bad today, sir. Oh, what you need is a good pot of some misudo. Yeah, there we go. That, yeah, that and the copper bracelet my abuelita gave me. That'll, uh, that should take care of it. There you go. Very cool. Uh, so how are you doing out there in, uh, Dallas today? I'm well, doing okay. Well, you know, we've got some thunderstorms here. Oh. You know, so that's probably why, you know, I probably sound bad right now. No, no, you sound good. Uh, as long as you're out in the rain, I think you're gonna be okay, sir. <laughs> Alright. Cool, cool. Uh, so anyway, like I told the people, uh, you're a comic book creator, and, uh, your, uh, your claim to fame is the El Gato Negro comic, uh, comic book. Uh, right. Which you saw called... El Gato the, the Nocturnal Warrior. The Nocturnal Warrior, Gato Negro. Uh, debuted in 1993, and, uh, uh under your own... October of 1993. There we go. Exact dates, folks. Let's stay, uh, on top of it here. Uh... Can you tell us how uh, how that started off as far as, it's under your own imprint, um, Azteca Productions. That's right. Uh, it started out as El Gato Negro, just as an idea, or just from doodling, uh, like uh, most uh, youngsters in the 80s, that they're going to a junior college and trying to do your studies. And, you know, you go up to those big lecture halls, uh, in those classes, and you're way up there trying, uh, you know, trying to get away from the... Uh, Instructors eye so they won't see you napping. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, some people are napping, some people are doodling, you know. Yep. So instead of taking notes, which, you know, which I should have been doing at that time. So all you students out there, don't try this at home, but students too. You know, <laughs> take all your notes, all you can to study. And of course, you know, like you know, all these cartoonists, you, know, you were doing all these little cartoons in your notebook. And, uh, when I was uh, creating El Gato Negro, I was, you know, just and then as part of uh, uh, trying to create your own uh, uh, comic book super team, you know, like we were doing back in the 80s. Right. And uh, they were pretty popular back then, you know, all those superhero groups of Marvel and DC, you know, with the DLA and Avengers and Alpha Flight, such like, like that, you know, you, you know, growing up with that out there. Yep. Uh, I was going to create my own, like, a little superhero group. And there was one particular character that I spun off and I put a lot of emphasis on that. That one was, uh, I didn't give it the name of El Gato Nangles yet because I couldn't think of anything uh, at that time. But I, you know, this certain character appealed to me. So I just uh, kind of threw the rest of the group on the side and the back burner of my mind and the side of this particular character. And uh, gave it more like a like a uh, a Latino Batman uh, persona to him. Came up with the name of uh, El Gato Negro. Hey, Richard, you know, I thought I was uh, well versed in Gato lore, but I didn't realize that you were actually uh, uh, playing around with yeah, doing your own uh, uh, um, Super Team book originally, and then Gato kind of just came from that because that's exactly. Uh, what happened with El Muerto? You know, he was. Yeah, yeah. That's, I didn't know that. It's really interesting. It's good to know. It's good to learn new things all the time on this show. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, and uh, that other super team that came out came out to be King Tejas later on. So. Uh, oh right, yeah. Just to throw that in there for the uh, listener. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember that book, King Tejas. Um. So when you yeah when you started uh, when you had the character formulated. Uh, what went across your mind as far as like, okay, do I pitch this to, you know, a company, one of the one of the publishers, or what made you actually take the jump to self-publishing? Well, you know, just like every other, uh, you know, uh, comic book artist, want to be enthusiast, uh, I approached, you know, you know DC and Marvel people. Uh, at that time, was at that time that was the, the big two. At that time, yeah, and uh, you know, they kind of closed the doors. Fall guy, just so uh, I took it upon myself to, uh, and with advice of others, uh, to uh, self 
able to to sing on my own. I I gave it the name El Gato Negro. Back to this, um, it kind of reminded me of, of the darkness and uh, give it bad luck to those who do evil. And then uh, growing up, also it, you know, like every other Mexican uh, little boy, you know, you grew up with lucha libre, so I wanted to give it a, a real good Hispanic time. Right. And uh, use that as his grandfather used to be a Mexican man who was the door. It gave him that name and it just passed down to the um, legacy down to his grandson. The modern name uh, is Gato Negro. Well, you know what? I'm glad that uh, DC and Marvel uh, didn't take you up on that because at least back then, I don't think they had any, as far as I know, and my memory's not the best, but I don't know if they had too many creator uh creator own type of deals or contracts. So I mean, you know, maybe it would have been something that you do it through them, but they would have uh you know, they would have owned the character, uh, you know? Well they would have owned it as well as butchered it up too. Yeah, yeah, I just think Don't right tell them what they'll do, you know, with, right. with the mainstream. Just so, just think today, uh yeah, if Elgato Negro went to one of the companies and there'd be some editor sitting there and a writer thinking of what's the latest gimmick they could do to get themselves on CNN news or something, you know, one of the <laughs> So I'm glad you stuck, uh, yeah, I'm glad you w- went ahead and self-published it. Um, I'm sure, you know, obviously a lot of good came out of that. I mean, just through my own experience and the other guests we've talked to. Oh, yeah. Yes, right. That, you know, but, you know, with that, the self-publishing was not an easy uh, road to take, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, learning from what I learned back then, uh, going, taking your creation out there, yeah, comic book convention. You mm-hmm. know, at that time they were pretty small, uh, especially here around the North Texas area. And then you meet some of the greats that you grew up uh, loving. You know? But uh, I wanted to, to uh, go back and, and let you know about the true origin of, of my great love of comics on there, and, uh, and and that's going back to the child of the '60s. You know? Oh yeah. Uh, and you know all the great back then, you know, that you have the Kirby's and the Ditto's, um, all the uh, amazing uh, fantasies and journey into mystery. Right, they were indeed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, back, it was like, I want to say 66 is when I was first uh, introduced into comics uh, by my uh, Mexican uncle. You know, some people had their Mexican fathers, I had an uncle that to comic he was a, a teenager at that time and he had a stack of comic books right next to his uh, bedroom right when he used to go out you know, out with his friends I was in go my grandmother's house and sneak into his room and write all those comic books right on his bed and just lay down and <laughs> look at them all <laughs> wow just looking at a whole bed of comic books that's awesome yeah you know you have your at that time you get your, your, your Kirby's and your Ditko oh my gosh Bob Kings and right. Rick Swans and everything, you know, and then and there was also not only the American comic book, but the uh, you know my Dia, you know, on my hands. They had one of those uh Mexican novella for the Dia. All oh, right comics. Yeah, the little comics. Yeah. Yeah, the the little ones with the the sepia tone. Oh yeah, beautiful. And and the, and co- the novel and everything. And these great so painted had great art in it. Yeah. They had I mean it was just surprised that they weren't you know, hired at that time hired by American comic book companies to do the best artists. Hey, were any, were any of those Mexicans? were also, you know, that introduced me into the world of comics. Right, right, right. Hey, I'm just curious if any of the Mexican comics you were looking at at that particular time, um, because some of them can be racy, I know, or a little edgy. I mean, what, what were the ones you were looking through, like, since they were your uncles? Uh, most that had the violence that had. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. All the racy ones, all the racy ones, uh, Javier will all put up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's good. He, he knew you were going to be looking through the comics, so he kind of just put the stuff appropriate. You know, just superheroes, action, and violence. Okay. 